Hello, my name is Michal Okler, and I'm going to be talking about pairs with heads and independent polynomials, which is a joint work with uh, Vasek Blaže and Pavel Dvořák. So it's all built around this uh, quite uh, well-known puzzle. So imagine you have uh, three bears sitting on vertices of a triangle. Uh, they can see each other. And then there's adversary, which we call uh, sage, uh, which makes them play this game. They all receive a hat of one of three possible colors. We denote them by numbers zero, one, and two. And uh, each one can receive arbitrary one of these three. For instance, it can be like this in the figure. And then they have to each guess uh, what color of hat they received. And they are not allowed to communicate with each other. They could only prearrange some strategy, how their answers, their guesses are going to look like. And uh, their goal is such that always at least one has to guess correctly. So the bears win if arbitrary, in arbitrary assignment of the heads. Uh, there is always at least one bear that guesses correctly. So in this case, we can denote the head colors by A, B, and C. And there is quite an easy strategy for the bears to use. Well, when we consider the colors to be the numbers 0, 1, and 2, each bear can test the hypothesis about what is the sum of these three numbers. So one bear tests whether the sum is equal to 0 modulo 3, one tests whether it is equal to 1 modulo 3, and the third one tests whether it's equal to 2 modulo 3. And uh, since they can, each bear can see uh, both the other ones, uh, he can calculate what his color would have to be uh, in order to uh, achieve the desired sum. So this is a winning strategy because always precisely one bear guesses correctly its own head color. And so there are some ways how we can change the puzzle. So for instance, we can restrict the visibility of bears. So instead of triangle, it could be path on three vertices and suddenly uh, there is a pair of bears that don't see each other or it could be arbitrary, more complex graph. We could allow each bear to receive different amount of hats. So um, one bear can receive only two possible head colors, one can receive four, et, et cetera. And the third one is we can allow each bear to take multiple guesses. So we can allow the bear to take, instead of one guesses, let's say two guesses. And uh, then we say that the bears uh, win if uh, at least one of the bears includes the real color of his head in the, his guesses. And the third uh, uh, ways, the third way to how of changing the puzzle is the one that we're going to be focusing on the most. But we're going to actually uh, incorporate all all three. So formally, a head guessing game is a triple uh, of a G, which is an undirected graph called the visibility graph. That was previously the triangle. Uh, number H, uh, which we call headness, and that's uh, how many colors of heads are available uh, for each bear. So it's in this setting, it's uniform. Every bear receives uh, can receive one of at most H uh, colors. And then G, guessing number, which uh, determines how many guesses each bear is allowed to make. And a strategy or the thing that the bears can prearrange uh, is a vector of functions, one for each bear, or we we conflate bears, bears with uh, vertices of, of the visibility graph. So one function for each uh, vertex of the graph and the function assigns to each possible coloring of its neighborhood, each possible hat assignment of, of its on its neighbors, uh, some set of guesses of size at most G, at most G or exactly G. So that's the uniform head guessing game. And then the non-uniform game is a triple, again, G of a G visibility graph. And then H, where now it's not a natural number, but it's a vector of natural numbers indexed by the vertices, which uh, determine the uh, number of possible heads for, that are available for each pair and the number of guesses that each pair is allowed to make. And from now on, we denote the vectors indexed by uh, vertices of V by bold letters to distinguish them from, from numbers. So having established these definitions, um, the classical parameter that is uh, associated with, with the sort of uh, single guess uh, uh, normal head guessing game is a head chromatic number. And head chromatic number mu of g is simply the largest integer h uh, for which the head guessing game on g when each pair uh, receives one of h colors 
uh, is winning. And so some previously known facts, uh, the head chromatic number of a complete graph on N vertices uh, is N. Actually, the strategy that I showed on the first slide uh, generalizes straightforwardly to the general setting. Uh, then for trees, it is actually at most two. Uh, for cycles, uh, which, is, which was shown by Butler and others. So for cycles, it's uh, quite complicated already. So the head chromatic number of cycle on N vertices is three if uh, the length of the cycle is multiple of three or the length is exactly four. And otherwise, the, uh, otherwise, uh, the head chromatic number of the cycle is two. This was uh, proved by Cheshla in 2014. And then uh, there's a universal upper bound uh, provided by, by Farnik. Uh, which uh, bounds the head chromatic number in terms of the maximum degree. So it's at most uh, E times uh, maximum degree plus one. And one recent, more recent result by Alon and others, they, they showed that the head chromatic number of the complete bipartite graph with two partites of size n has a head chromatic number asymptotically at least n to the one half minus uh, little o of one. Okay. So motivated by this study of head chromatic number, we introduce a fractional head chromatic number, uh, which is uh, defined, it's denoted by mu with a hat. And uh, it's defined as a supremum of uh, H over G, such that uh, the head guessing game on graph of visibility graph G uh, with uh, where each pair uh, receives one of at most H uh, possible heads and is allowed to take G guesses is a winning game. So we're trying to, we're looking for the largest uh, fractions of headness to guessing number such that the head guessing game is winning. And as an example, to show that this actually is different from the regular head chromatic number, we look at uh, path on three vertices. So the head chromatic number of P3 is two, but uh, the fractional head chromatic number of P3 is actually at least five two. And let me quickly sketch how, uh, how the strategy would work for five available head colors and two guesses. So imagine you have this path P3 with vertices X, Y, and Z, and the vertices receive colors A, B, and C. And now both the, uh, now we, we consider the colors to be uh, from the set zero up to four, so that we can use arithmetic module, module five. And so the, endpoints, the vertex X and Z. So the X, they both base their guesses on the color of, of Y. So the vertex X guesses the set B, B plus one, again, modulo five. And the vertex Z guesses B, B plus two, again, modulo five. And now if we look at the middle vertex Y, uh, it can see the both the colors uh, A and C. So he can sort of think backwards and uh, think about, well, what, if I had some sort of color, then the vertex X would have guessed correctly its own color. So if Y received the color A or A minus one, then the X would actually include his real head color in, in its guesses. And similarly, if, if the middle vertex had the color C or C minus two, then again, uh, the vertex Z would actually include uh, its correct color in its guesses and therefore the bears would win. So. What remains for the middle vertex to try are the are all the options when we when it removes uh, uh, the a a minus one and c c minus two, and uh, luckily these two sets were chosen in a way such that they uh, their intersection is at most one, the size of their intersection, and therefore uh, subtracting these two sets leaves uh, the middle vertex with uh, just two possible options for for his own head color, and th those are the two that. Uh, it guesses. So let me remark that actually the head chromatic number of P3 is, is larger and we know its exact value, but we'll come to that uh, later. And in fact, we can show that for paths and cycles, as n uh, approaches infinity, then the head fractional head chromatic number of paths and cycles approaches four. So and as we've seen, the head chromatic number of paths cannot be larger than two. And the uh, head chromatic number of cycles oscillates between two and three, depending on the uh, module three of, of, of its length. OK, so this shows that the parameter behaves differently. 
And now we have a few results for this fractional uh, in this fractional setting on cliques. So first we proved that uh, exactly what kind of uh, happiness and guess functions are winning, like can be won by the bears on complete graph. So if we take a complete graph on n vertices, then the bears and with some function uh, with the vector of, of headnesses and vector of guessing numbers for each pair, then the bears can win if and only if uh, the sum of the fractions uh, GV over HV is at least one. And uh, I remarked that uh, we actually uh, provide an easy way to compute the strategies. So it's uh, not like an existential proof, but it's a, there's a, a efficient way how to compute the strategy, winning strategy for bears if we're given these vectors H and G that satisfy this condition. And moreover, uh, we want to kind of use cliques to uh, join two winning graphs into a larger winning graph. So let G1 and G2 be two graphs. And there's a set S in G1 that induces a complete graph in G1. And the special vertex V in, in G2. And the clique join of G1 and G2 with respect to S and V is the graph G that is obtained by uh, removing V from G2 and then connecting every vertex in S with every former neighbor of V. Or in other words, you can look at it uh, as the uh, result of operation where we inflate V with a clique of size S and then we identify this with, with S in G1. And what we were able to show is that if we have a head guessing uh, game on uh, graph G1 with uh, the vectors H1 and G1 and uh, head guessing game on graph G2 with uh, again, uh, head guessing uh, the vectors H2 and G2 and they're both winning uh for the bears then if we take a click join with these uh, two graphs and we set the headnesses and guessing a number of guesses of the bears such that they stay the same if in g1 outside of s and they stay the same in g2 outside of v but for all the vertices in s we actually uh set their uh, the total heads available for them to be the original number of heads available for, for the vertex times the uh, number of heads available for the vertex V in G2. And we set the guessing number of such vertex to be uh, the guessing number of the vertex in, in the original head guessing game in G1 times uh, the, uh, head, the, the guessing, uh, the number of guesses that the bear on vertex V was allowed to make. So uh, the, the, guess, the number of guesses and number of heads stays the same outside of the vertex, the vertex set S. And in S, it's uh, obtained as taking the value in G1 and then multiplying it with the respective value for, for V. And I'll not go into the proof here. It's not complicated, but it would take uh, quite a bit of time to go through properly. But let me just say that the main idea is that once we color, we assign the heads on the bears on, of G, then for the bears in S, we actually interpret their color as a pair uh, of uh, the, the, ver the color uh, that in, in like the game on G1 and uh, in a color of the vertex V. So, uh, and this allows us to uh, simulate the game on G1 using strategy on G1 and the game on G2 uh, using a strategy on G2 and then just uh, cleverly combining them together to, to guarantee that always there is a bear that guesses correctly. And this lemma will come into play later. But now I finally get to the second part of the title, which is the independence polynomial. And what we are interested in is the signed independence polynomial of a graph G uh, on vector of variables x, one for each uh, vertex. And that's defined as the sum of minus one to the sum over all independent sets i, uh, minus one to the size of this independent set times the product of all the variables corresponding to the vertices in this independent set. And uh, the monovariate version of this signed independence polynomial denoted by ug of x is obtained simply by plugging the same variable x uh, for each of the original variables x subscript v. 
So uh, just a quick note that usually in the literature, people consider independence polynomial, uh, which is uh, almost the same, except there is not this minus one to the uh, size of i term. And in fact, our signed independence polynomial is obtained from this independence polynomial by simply plugging uh, minus x, like uh, uh, adding a sign to each of the variables. And um, for graph g, there's an important set of uh, vectors connected with, with this uh, independence polynomial. And so for graph G, we denote by R of G, the set of all vectors R of uh, non-negative uh, values, such that the signed independence polynomial evaluates uh, to positive value for every vector W that is uh, less at most R, that is at most R, and by at most r, we mean uh, comparing the vectors entry-wise. So to recap, the vector r belongs to the set r of g. Uh, if, uh, if we take vector w, which is uh, at most r in each coordinate, then the signed independence polynomial evaluates to positive value. So to sort of illustrate this, uh, we have this uh, multi-dimensional uh, set and we have uh, this area where which uh, you know uh, there is a zero and there is this area of all the uh, uh, vectors that uh, satisfy this this definition and why how is this connected well um, scott and sokal 2005 proved uh, a version of lovas lakal lemma that connects this set r of g with uh, the claim of, of, of uh, lovas lakal lemma so if we take uh, graph G and uh, we let A, V be a family of events on some probability space and every event A for some vertex A, V is independent of all the vertices of all the events that are uh, not, uh, that it's not neighboring it with. So all the vertices, all the events A, W for W that's not in the closed neighborhood. And now if we suppose that uh, P is a vector of real numbers between zero and one, uh, such that the probability of the event AV is at most this PV, and this vector of probabilities belongs to the uh, R of G, then actually there, it's an, with non-zero probability, uh, the intersection of the complements of every event happens. So, it's essentially saying that as long as your probabilities uh, belong to this set R of G, then uh, the claim of usual Lovas Lakal lemma uh, holds. And we can use this pretty much uh, straightforwardly by uh, applying it to a previous uh, proof using Lovas Lakal lemma to show that if we take a non uniform head guessing game on graph G with these vectors H and G, then such a game is losing whenever the vector of fractions of guessing number over uh, headness of, uh, of all vectors uh, belongs to this set uh, R of G. So we have a sort of this area around zero where uh, the game must be losing, the bears cannot win. And then there's interesting thing happening on the boundary of, of this area. So we say that the strategy for some head guessing game is perfect if it's winning, and moreover, no matter the head arrangement, two bears that uh, can see each other never guess at the same time, never guess correctly at the same time. So, because if two bears that can see each other guess correctly uh, simultaneously, that can see that can be seen as wasteful. Like they could have arranged somehow a uh, better strategy that uh, uh, that does not have this property, right? And we managed to show that if there is a perfect strategy for head guessing game uh, G H G, uh, then uh, if you look at the again the vector of these fractions of guessing numbers over headness headnesses, then uh, for this vector of ratios, uh, the signed independence polynomial evaluates to zero, and for every entry-wise smaller uh, or at most that large uh, vector W, the independent signed polynomial is non-negative. So in some sense, the only place that the perfect strategies can lie is exactly the boundary uh, of this set R of G. So you know, we have the losing games inside and then perfect strategies on the boundary. So what happens outside? 
Well, we can answer this question for coral grams. So uh, we use uh, not perhaps the most standard definition of coral graphs. So we say that the cleat creek of a graph G is simply a tree whose vertices are exactly the subsets that induce maximal cliques in the graph. And for each vertex uh, V, the vertices in the, in the tree that contain, that like are the cliques that contain V induces a connected subtree. And the graph is chordal if and only if it possesses a cleat tree. So here we can see a chordal graph with two max with its three maximal cliques uh, highlighted by blue, red, and green, and then on the right we can see the clique tree that shows that this is actually a chordal graph. And for chordal graphs, we actually managed to prove that if we take a chordal graph and a vector of rational numbers from the interval zero one, so if this vector of rational numbers does not belong to the set R of G then there are actually vectors uh, G and H of the guessing numbers and hatnesses, such that the ratio of, of uh, GV over HV is at most this prescribed vector RV. And moreover, the game on these particular hatnesses and guessing numbers is winning. So it's kind of a complement to the uh, Lovas local application giving us the losing thing. So for girdle graphs, if we take a rational vector that lies outside of the set R, then actually uh, there are some uh, ways to assign guess hatnesses and guessing numbers to each pair such that the ratio is bounded from above by this ve prescribed vector r and the game is winning and just quickly to go over the proof idea so you simply take the chordal graph look at the clique tree this is the chordal graph from the previous slide and now you take a clique that's a leaf in this clique tree Let's say that's this was this triangle on the left. And now we kind of separate the graphs into two such that they can be put together to the original graph by a clique join, right? Taking these the blue vertex and these this edge and taking a clique join of these two graphs with respect to this edge and this vertex gives exactly this original graph. And then we assign the ratios to these um, modified vertices such that for, for the clique that was in the leaf, we take the minimum possible ratio such that the uh, game is winning, can be winning on the clique. So in this case, it's uh, four fives, because as we recall, we need the ratios to sum to one uh, in order to, to have this game winning. And then we simply uh, calculate what the ratios have to be here, such that we obtain the original ones by multiplication with, with, this, with this four fives. And then we do the same with the uh, other clique. Now we end up in a state where we have uh, actually separated everything into cliques, and we can if we we can show that all these cliques are uh, satisfy the winning condition that the ratio sum to at least one. And then going back, uh, we uh, construct the strategies kind of using the the clique join lemma, just straightforwardly applying it. Which also means that this is actually provides an algorithm how to efficiently compute the strategies. For, for the bears. All right, so for coral graphs, we have this picture and there's this set of RG. Inside we have losing games, outside we have winning games and on the boundary there are, the perf there are perfect strategies or this is the only place that the perfect strategies can appear. All right, and so finally to end this, so if we apply this to the univariate uh, um, independence polynomial, we get that the fractional head chromatic number is equal to the uh, inverse of the smallest positive root, root of this uh, independence polynomial. So it gives us an easy way how to compute actually the fractional head chromatic number of any chordal graph. So for instance, if we take our chordal graph to be star with n leaves, k1n, then we can evaluate the independence polynomial. And by solving it for r, we get that uh, are the, the smallest positive proof is roughly log n over n. And now, if you think about it, if you take any graph, then it contains a star with uh, the, the number of leaves that's equal to its maximum degree. So this shows that the fractional head chromatic number of any graph G is actually bounded from below by the maximum degree of G over the logarithms of, logarithm of maximum uh, uh, degree of G. So this shows that the fractional head chromatic number is actually tightly sandwiched between uh, 
the maximum degree of g and the maximum degree of g over logarithm of maximum degree of g. And that's it for me. Thank you.